Good afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you uh, to the Dudleyan Lectureship for 2005. Um, in his 1953 Dudleyan Lecture, uh, our former colleague of the late Perry Miller, the great American historian, uh, said the following, a history of the Dudleyan Lectures is in fact an epitome of the modern intellect, at least as that intellect impinged upon Harvard. And indeed, the list of names going back in the Dudleyan lectureship is, uh, uh, reads like a who's who uh, in scholarship. Uh, it is Harvard's oldest endowed lectureship, uh, established in 1750 uh, by the bequest of Paul Dudley, 1675-1751, um, who graduated in 1690 from Harvard College. Uh, the uh, word on Dudley, according to Sibley's uh, biographical sketches of graduates of Harvard University, is that he appears to have been a normal undergraduate with no unusual fines and only one large bill for broken glass. So uh, auspicious uh, background to the donor of the, uh, uh, to, the named, uh, 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 to the name that we have for the Dudley uh, lectures. Dudley, however, came along uh, a bit after leaving Harvard and eventually served as Attorney General and Chief Justice of Massachusetts. Justice Dudley says in his will, which was dated January 1st, 1750, the yearly income, interest, or profits of the sum before mentioned, that is 133 pounds, six shillings, and eight pence, to be applied toward the erecting, maintaining, supporting, and continuing an anniversary sermon or lecture to be held or preached at the said college once every year successively by such persons as the trustees of the said legacy shall choose and appoint. And from that time to this, there has been a small committee of trustees who have, have, uh, have made the final choice of the Dudley and lecturers. The will ends with this note, postscript. Let him that preaches the last lecture before mentioned be a sound, grave, experienced divine, and at least 40 years of age. And let, and let those that preach the several lectures aforesaid have their stipend or pay given them as soon as may be. So I trust that we're still going to manage in all of these matters to, to meet the, uh, the terms of the donor. Under the four rubrics uh, designated by Justice Dudley, uh, which were intended to be given in rotation, and we indeed still follow a rotation on the, on the lectureship. The first is on natural religion. The second, and I think we're in the second cycle now, is on revealed religion. The third was to be on the Romish church. And the fourth on Presbyterian or congregational ordination, now known as the validity of non-Episcopal ordination. Perry Miller interpreted Judge Dudley's fourth rubric in this manner. New England had to reconcile itself to being a self-confessed community of dissenters, its way of life protected against the Church of England only by the Toleration Act of 1689. Hence, Judge Dudley wanted the fourth lecture to defend the validity of congregational or Presbyterian, that is, non-Episcopal ordination, so that students should be immunized against the doctrine of apostolic succession. Um, and indeed... <laughs> I should say about the, the, the third uh, of the lectures before I finally turn to uh, let our speaker be introduced, um, because I think this may be of interest, that the Romish church lecture gave problems uh, even at the beginning of last century, not only as it would probably at the beginning of this century. Uh, and in fact, at the meeting of the trustees on May 31st, 1911, uh, the, the president informed the trustees that the corporation had desired him to use his influence with them to omit the third Dudleyan lecture on the idolatry of the Romish church, their damnable heresies, and other crying wickednesses, which is a quote from the original, the original uh, uh, lectureship. So this was removed. Uh, this was appropriately removed. And we were also instructed to provide the other three lectures in rotation in the stead of the four. It was therefore voted that the trustees concurred in this arrangement, and since that time we have had three Dudleyan lectures uh, uh, in alternation, with quite, as I said, a distinguished list of people just in recent years, uh, scholars as, and, and, and thinkers and public figures as distinguished as Beverly Harrison, Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, Rosemary Ruther, 
Nicholas Voldersdorf, uh, Alastair McIntyre, Margaret Mitchell, and Syed Hossein Nasser have delivered this lecture. And it's a great pleasure tonight to have with us Miroslav Wolf from Yale. I'm going to turn the podium over now to my colleague, Francis Fiorenza, to deliver an appropriate introduction for Professor Wolf. Thank you. Well, I should add maybe one comment on the Dudleyan uh, lecture. Uh, uh, my own professor, um, Johannes Baptist Metz, who together with Jorgen Moltmann, uh, Miroslav's professor in Germany, uh, was invited to give the Dudleyan lecture. And uh, uh, he asked me to accompany him here because he was insecure being in the United States. Unfortunately, the time was right after Elizabeth and I had gotten married. And so Elizabeth always went around complaining. She was saying that... Uh, Instead of uh, going on a honeymoon, Francis went off with his German professor while his German professor gave the Dudleyan lecture. <laughs> so uh, so it's, uh, it, the Dudleyan lecture has that reputation in our family. <laughs> um, but um, I made up for it, and uh, we decided this year to go to, for, uh, to, go to China uh, for the, instead <laughs> for our honeymoon. <laughs> A little bit late, you see. <laughs> uh, let, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Miroslav Welf. Uh, um, he uh, did his uh, a doctorate uh, with a summa cum laude in tubing in uh, on the uh, Professor Jorgen Moltmann, one of the leading founders of, of the theology of hope and political theology and uh, attempts to, to interrelate uh, faith and, and political life. Um, in Germany, one has to also write a second uh, a, a, a doctorate uh, in habilitation, uh, which he did under uh, Professor Jorgen Moltmann. Uh, he has been uh, an associate professor at Fuller Theological Seminary uh, and is presently the Henry B. Wright Professor of Theology at Yale Divinity School uh, in, 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 in New Haven. Uh, I, I should point out, I remember having breakfast with Miroslav because he had um, received an invitation to actually go back to the University of Heidelberg. And there was a choice in his mind between going to the University of Heidelberg and to the University of Yale uh, and to Yale Divinity School. And he made the decision for Yale. Um, I think Heidelberg is such a beautiful city. Uh, <laughs> that is the only flaw that I can see in Miroslav's uh, theological and, 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 and judgment. Uh, but uh, I, 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 uh, I, I, I should mention that uh, he did his dissertation on the, uh, uh, the, the uh, transliteration of it is uh, the future of work, work in the future, the, the concept of work with Karl Marx and its theological evaluation. And it, at that time, I had actually done a little bit of work on work, and Miroslav and I, at an AER meeting, had a chance very early to meet and discuss the various theologies of work. It got translated into English, and the work in the spirit taught a theology of work. Uh, he's much more known for a couple of other important volumes, one of them, Exclusion and Embrace, a Theological Exploration of Identity, Otherness, and, and Reconciliation. And reconciliation has almost become an important topic of theological reflection. And I would say that Miroslav's uh, work on this is extremely important. Uh, he has then known an important work on, in, uh, on the Trinity and community, in which he argues that one cannot understand different concepts of the community without taking into account the Trinity. Uh, that had, has been translated into English as after our likeness, the church as an image of the triune God. And, and one can say there's probably, there is a um, revival of Trinitarian thought in a lot of contemporary theology. And I think, uh, I state without any exaggeration that I think Miroslav stands behind that, that revival and is inspired it in many words, uh, ways. And some of the current discussions about gift, et cetera, go back to some of the theological creativity uh, of, of Miroslav. Uh, I should mention he's edited in, uh, with Judith M. Guntry, uh, The Spacious Heart, Essays on Identity and Togetherness. And so he has a, his wife is a, is a, is a fairly well-known uh, uh, New Testament scholar. Uh, I happen to know another systematic theologian who has a wife as a New Testament scholar. Uh, 
And, <laughs> and uh, so, and uh, he is presently working actually uh, on, 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 on the concept of memory, and I'm hoping that out of this talk, uh, we would get an insight into a future work that might deal with that topic. And with that, I introduce Maris Loss. I'm very thankful to my Romish friend <laughs> for his very kind words of introduction. Just one uh, small minor uh, mistake. Uh, work in the Spirit was not translation of the German dissertation. It was a theology work that grew out of a work of a dissertation. A dissertation remains untranslated into um, English. It's in Korean and uh, Croatian. And so, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm very honored to be here with you and, um, and be in this um, a line of distinguished uh, thinkers. Uh, I do qualify. I'm over 40. So, <laughs> <laughs> The title of my lecture is Memory, Salvation, and Perdition. We remember Auschwitz and all that it symbolizes because we believe that, in spite of the past and its horrors, the world is worthy of salvation and salvation like redemption, can be found only in memory. Elie Wiesel spoke these words in German Reichstag in the address delivered on November 10, 1987, 50 years after the infamous Kristallnacht in which mobs went through the street of, streets of Nazi Germany, destroying Jewish property and helping to set in motion the horrors of the Holocaust. The words sum up a theme that runs like a red thread through Wiesel's work. The saving power of remembering wrongs that we have perpetrated or suffered. As he himself puts it, faith in memory's saving power. Faith that it will heal individuals concerned and help rid the world of violence is his central obsession. Among our contemporaries, Wiesel may be one most obsessed, the one most obsessed with memory of wrongs and pain. But belief in the redemptive power of such memory is widespread today. Psychologists and novelists, historians and philosophers, cultural critics and politicians are repeating the injunction, remember, like a reassuring drumbeat. For many, the injunction to remember has the same foundational status as the call believe had for Protestant Christians since Martin Luther famously declared, if you believe, you shall have all things. If you believe in Christ, you will be justified before God, insisted Luther. If you remember wrongs suffered and caused, you will find salvation in history, urges Elie Wiesel, and along with him, many of our contemporaries. It is almost as if for many today, memory has taken place once occupied by religion. But is memory such an unambiguous good? How strong is the link between memory and salvation? Is the memory of wrongs, isn't the memory of wrongs suffused with pain and suffering? Hasn't it sometimes pushed those who remember to inflict pain and suffering upon others? Doesn't it then have a link to perdition and not just to salvation? And if memory is integral to salvation but can also lead to perdition, how should we remember for memory to be truly saving? In, the unfolding, the relation, in unfolding the relation between memory, salvation, and perdition, I will mainly consider the memory of wrongs committed and suffered. In addition to remembering wrongs and sufferings, we remember many other things as well. Stories from our childhood, adolescent dreams and disappointments, successes and failures in our work, history of our people, religious instruction, and so on. Though all such memories are central to who we are and how we live, I will not address them here. My theme is not memory in general, but memory of wrongs and sufferings. Moreover, I will examine here only the question whether such memory is in some significant sense saving. There may be other reasons to remember wrongs, irrespective of whether our remembering is saving or not, say out of sheer duty towards sufferers, or because of unyielding demands of justice, or simply because to be a human being means to remember such things. I will leave here these reasons for remembering aside. Here my topic is 
memory, and salvation. There are two ways to understand the link between memory and salvation. We can consider memory as the content of salvation, as when we think that without memories of wrongs we have suffered, we would have a gaping hole in our identity. And we can consider memory as a means to salvation, as when we think that memory of violence committed protects people from becoming victims in the future. I will explore these two ways of linking memory and salvation in turn and devote two major sections of my lecture to each. So first, the pleasure and the pain of memory. Salvation lies in memory, argued Elie Wiesel. But, is it, but it is not obvious that we should associate memory of wrongs with salvation or with anything positive for that matter. You'll pardon me if I'm autobiographical in these comments here, but the question of memory for me is very much autobiographical, and so some of it uh, I hope will not be, well, too inappropriate, uh, some of my memories. But here I go. I dread, for instance, the memory of long hours of terrifying interrogations to which the officers of the Yugoslavian army have subjected me in the winter of 1984. The reason is simple. It is painful to relive these experiences in memory. In memory. As long as it is remember, remembered, the past is not just past. It is taken up into the present and given a new lease on life. If the experiences from the past are pleasant, their new life in memory will be welcomed, of course. Consider memories of Johannes, the fictitious author of Soren Kierkegaard's Seducer's Diary. He is keeping the diary not just to record his past conquests, but to recollect them, and in recollecting them, make them an occasion for the second enjoyment, as he puts it. We may object that his conquests are exploitative and his memory compulsive, but from his perspective, an esthete whose main goal in life is to make life interesting, the point of remembering is clear. Memory multiplies pleasures because it represents the original experience. Memory often fails, of course, and the record of the past is erased. Distant events fade into background and dis disappear. Pleasure experienced in the past remi remains just that. Pleasure past swallowed up by the night of non-remembrance and lost forever. But more, the more vivid the memory, the more the past becomes a present delight. Just as memory of pleasure repeats past pleasure, so memory of pain repeats past pain. The moment here in a flash, gone in a flash, does after all return as a ghost once more and disturbs the peace of a later moment, wrote Friedrich Nietzsche in one of his unfashionable observations entitled Utility and Liability of History. Consider traumatic memories. We tend to repress them when the suffering undergone seems unbearable. Yet often what was repressed resurfaces in flashbacks beyond our control, and then we experience anew the horror of past pain. Even if we doubt the reality of repression, as scholars increasingly do, the point still stands. To remember suffering endured is to keep one's wounds open. The larger the wound and the better the recollection, the more past pain and present merge, the more past and present merge and past suffering becomes present pain. If memory repeats and revives the original suffering, how could salvation lie in memory? One could argue, however, that all memory of pain isn't itself painful. At the end of his masterpiece, City of God, Augustine distinguishes between two kinds of knowledge of evil, which he correlates with two kinds of memory. In one kind of knowledge, evil is, as he writes, accessible to apprehension by the mind. In the other, it is a matter of direct experience. The first is like med a medical doctor's knowledge of a disease, and the second like a patient's knowledge of the same disease. The blessed in the world to come, Augustine argued, will remember their own past wrongdoing the way a medical doctor knows a disease she has never experienced. 
they will have no sensible recollection of past evils, he writes. Such recollection, quote, will be completely erased from their feelings, end quote. Even though Augustine does not explain how such an erasure will happen in the world to come, the underlying conviction which leads him to speak of erasure of feelings of pain is plausible enough. If we are reliving pain in memory, we are not yet fully redeemed. But can we remember past suffering without remembering the feeling that accompanied it? Depending on the mood, I can either remember my father's funeral simply as a fact or can feel deeply saddened by the thought of the disappearance of this extraordinarily good man from my life. So one can remember an event without remembering the emotion which originally accompanied it. But a memory without such an emotion is a significantly altered memory. As Avishai Margolit argued in Ethics of Memory, sensibility or the feelings that are tied to the events remembered is an essential component of a memory of an event whenever the feelings are part of the original experience of the event. I quote, the amazement and horror in watching the collapse of the Twin Towers in New York, let alone of being there, is the kernel of the memory of the collapse and not ketchup added on top of it. Memories of suffering undergone with no corresponding feelings of pain or deep sympathy involve forgetting at their very core. I can remember my dad's funeral without sadness only if I let forgetting of the emotional dimension of the event alter my remembering. This is, in fact, exactly how Augustine thought about the matter. The two ways of knowing evil, knowing by apprehension of mind and knowing by experience, have two corresponding ways, ways of forgetting evil, writes Augustine. The learned scholar's way of forgetting is different, different from that of the one who has experienced suffering. The scholar forgets, as we all know, by neglecting his studies. The sufferer, by escaping from his misery. With this distinction of forgetting in mind, forgetting of facts and forgetting of misery, Augustine then claimed that past evils will be completely erased from their, meaning the saints, feelings. In Augustine's account, the life of the blessed involves not just memory of past wrongs, but also forgetting, forgetting of how suffering and evil felt. With regard to salvation, the excision from memory of the pain endured is, a, is as significant as the memory of the event itself. If salvation lies in memory, must it then not be the kind of memory that, is at its, that, it, that at its heart includes forgetting of pain? For surely, as long as the pain is felt, salvation cannot be complete. May I grab a glass of water here? My second section is entitled Memory and Identity. But maybe we should not be so preoccupied with memory's pain, at least not before we have reached that state of the blessed whose memories Augustine wanted to purge of any sensible recollection of evil. For memories do not merely cause pleasure or pain. They also decisively shape our identities. In our private persons, we are much of what we remember about ourselves. I am who I am because I remember having lived in Novi Sad, in communist Yugoslavia, having done this or that mischief, or having been laughed at at school by students and teachers alike because my father was a Pentecostal minister. Similarly, in our public persons, we are what others remember about us. I am who I am on account of what my parents remember about my childhood or how my colleagues have come to view me on the basis of their memory of my actions and reactions or how my readers remember my books and articles. Memory, the argument goes, is central to identity to the extent that we, are, we sever ourselves from memories of what we have done and what has happened to us, we will lose our proper identity. If suffering was part of our past, 
pain will be part of our identity. We need to embrace our memories along with their pain, otherwise we will not be true to ourselves. In that way, salvation lies in memory insofar as that memory protects us from distorting our very selves and living a lie. But what exactly is the relationship between memory and identity? Let's accept for a moment that we are, to a significant degree, what we remember. Don't we remember many widely discordant things about ourselves? Betrayals and fidelity, pain and delight, hatred and love, cowardice and heroism, as well as thousands of bland moments not worthy of description. The memory that makes us up is a quilt that we have stitched from the ever-growing mountain of multicolored shreds of discrete memories. What will be stitched into the quilt and what will be discarded, or what will feature prominently on that quilt and what will form a background will depend greatly on how we put our memories together and how others, from those who are closest to us all the way to the culture as a whole, put them together for us. We are not just shaped by memories, we ourselves shape the memories that shape us. And since we do, the consequences are significant. For then our identities cannot consist simply in what we remember. Because we can react to our memories, we are larger than our memories. If our reactions to memories were simply determined by the memories themselves, then we would be slaves of the past. Unless we have been severely damaged and are in desperate need of healing, we have a measure of freedom with regard to our memories. To the extent that we are psychologically healthy, our identity will consist in our ability to respond in freedom to our memories and in our free responses to memories and not just in those memories themselves. Moreover, aren't we also what we hope for the future? It is true the past can rob us of the future, just like it can rob us of the present. But here again, our dreams cannot be just forward projections of our memories, for then we would be nailed down to our past, and our future would be only its boring and oppressive extension. A person with a healthy sense of identity will let the future draw her out of the past and the present and will play with new possibilities and embark upon new paths. With regard to our past, present, and future, we are a great deal more than our memories, and how memories shape our identity depends not just on our memories themselves, but on what we and others do with these memories. To return to my own example, I can see myself primarily as the one who was terrorized by powerful people against whom I was helpless and whose intentions I could not discern. Or I could see myself primarily as a person who, after some suffering, has been delivered by God and given a new life, much like in their sacred writings, ancient Israelites saw themselves not primarily as those who suffered in Egypt, but as those who were delivered by Yahweh. I can be angry at the suffering I can be thankful about deliverance. I can be both. I can also let that year of suffering recede somewhere into distant background and stretch myself into the future. I can try to make something out of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, which I direct. I can work on a book about theology and ethics of fashion, which I would like to do. <laughs> uh, or... <laughs> or live for my two sons, Nathaniel and Aaron. All sorts of possibilities are there. Not all experiences of pain will be as compliant as I'm suggesting mine are. Some will stubbornly insist on being at the heart of our identity. These memories define us without us having much say in the matter. But clearly, these are an exception and not the rule. And the healthier a person is, the more of an exception they will be. If salvation lies in memory of wrongs committed, it must therefore lie more in what we do with memories than in memories themselves. And what we do with memories will depend on how we see ourselves in the present and how we project ourselves into the future. So far I have taken Wiesel's claim that salvation lies in memory of wrongs to mean that such memory is a component of salvation which is to say that salvation lies literally in remembering. But the claim could also be taken to mean that memory is essential in order to achieve salvation that lies outside of memory. 
This is how Wiesel primarily intended the claim, though, he's very much, though he very much insists on the importance of memory of wrongdoing for identity. In this second sense, memory is more a means to salvation <clears throat> than a content of salvation. One can understand memory as a means of salvation in at least four distinct, though closely related ways. And that's what I want to explore in this second part of my lecture. Memory, healing, and acknowledgement. First part of second part. One way to think about memory as a means of salvation is to relate it to personal healing. Psychological wounds caused, caused by suffering can be healed only if a person passes through the narrow door of painful memories. In other words, she must endure pain of memory to reach a cure, one of Sigmund Freud's basic insights. An unexpressed traumatic experience is like a foreign body, he writes, which long after its entry must continue to be regarded as an agent that is still at work. Healing is possible only if someone recollects the event along with the emotional state that accompanied it by bringing into the light of knowledge both the event and the co-current emotion. Therapy provides an opportunity, he writes, for the normal discharge of the process of excitation. Since the feeling accompanying the event is no since the feeling accompanying the event is, is no longer, as Freud puts it, strangulated, but set free, healing can take place. Now, we can interpret Freud as meaning that the mere fact of remembering what was repressed, events and emotional reactions to them, will result in healing at least to some degree. Shine the light of knowledge into the dungeon where memories of suffering and wrongdoing are locked up, and you will be freed from, the from their clandestine and subversive work. But this cannot be right. If the mere fact of remembering a traumatic experience had healing power, you would not have to have repressed the memory in the first place. Memory does no more than repeat the original trauma in an altered form, and repetition as such is a problem. It isn't a solution. As the trauma literature consistently notes, for the wounded psyches to be healed, we must not only remember traumatic experiences, in one way or another, we must also integrate the retrieved memories into a broader pattern of our life stories, either by making sense of the traumatic experiences or by tagging them as third elements in our lives. Salvation understood as personal healing is accomplished not so much by remembering the traumatic event and emotions which have accompanied it as by interpreting memories and inscribing them into a larger pattern of meaning. As I relive the memory, as I relive in memory the humiliation and pain of my military police interrogations, I can tell myself, for instance, that the suffering has made me a better person, say, in the way that it has drawn me closer to God or made me more empathetic to, to the suffering of, other, of others. It probably hasn't, but I can tell myself that. Uh, or, I can come to believe that it has contributed in some small way to exposing the injustice of a regime that controlled its citizens, curtailed their freedoms, and sacrificed their well-being out of a commitment to an unworkable ideology. In either case, healing will come about not by remembering, but by seeing memories and the experiences they hold in a new light. Put more generally, the memory of suffering is a precondition for healing, not the means of healing itself. The means of healing is the interpretative work a person does with memory. A second way to understand memory as a means of salvation concerns acknowledgement. The interrogations to which I was subjected would not have been possible without cooperation of my fellow soldiers. They sought to lure me into conversations about politically sensitive topics. Pacifism was one of them, and I was a pacifist. Um, and provided me with literature potentially subversive to the communist regime to elicit my responses, which the police then secretly taped. To those familiar with what was going on, to those not familiar with what was going on, these soldiers would have looked like perfectly decent human beings, and yet they were willingly participating in an attempt potentially to ruin the life of an innocent person. 
If no one remembers a misdeed or names it publicly, it remains invisible. On one level, the victim is not a victim and the perpetrator is not a perpetrator. Both are misperceived because the one's violence and the other's suffering go unrecognized. A double injustice occurs. The first when the original deed is done and the second when it is made to disappear. The injustice of concealing wrongs fuels the strong urge of many victims to have, <coughs> feels a strong urge many victims have to speak about their suffering. Because the act of public acknowledgement and public remembrance, the act of public remembrance is an act of acknowledgement, it is therefore also an act of justice. This holds true both at personal and broader political levels. Commenting on the work of South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, André de Troyes writes, The victims of political killings cannot be brought back to life, nor can the harm and trauma of torture and abuse somehow be negated. What can be done, though, is publicly to restore the civic and human dignity of those victims precisely by acknowledging the truth of what was done to them. This was the function and purpose of the victims' hearings, where people were enabled to tell their stories and to have them publicly acknowledged in non-adversarial procedures. Acknowledgement is essential to personal and social healing. Notice, however, what acknowledgement means here. It doesn't mean victims' unqualified remembrance, but the truth of what was done to them. No doubt, our first duty is simply to attend to victims' experiences and memories as they present them to us. But ultimately, we cannot put aside the question of truth. Scholars who study memory are unambiguous. Memories are notoriously unreliable. There is no reason to think that victims' <coughs> memories are an exception. The victims often do remember correctly the pain of their undeniable suffering and the an understandable range rage can easily distort their memories. My own memory of interrogations by Captain, Gora Captain Goranovich and his superior is a case in point. As I've remembered and occasionally retold the story, the interrogator's brut brutality has tended to grow, even as basic facts remain the same. I would conveniently leave out the fact that my fellow soldiers did not act out of malice, but out of desire to please superiors in exchange for small benefits like longer hours off base. I found myself portrayed, portraying perpetrators as greater villains than who, in my better moments, I knew that they in fact were. I was unjust toward them. And injustice is the proper term here, even if we do feel reluctant to suggest that a victim may be guilty of it. If victims' truthful stories are a form of justice, then their deceitful memories must be a form of injustice. And an unjust memory of wrongdoing is not a means of salvation. Truthful and therefore just memory is. Untruthful memories add to the evil they're intended to subtract from. My final section, memory, solidarity, and protection. A third way memory can serve as means of salvation is by generating solidarity with victims. Remembering suffering awakens us from slumber of indifference and goads us on to fight against the suffering and oppression around us. Or so the argument goes. To struggle against evil, we must empathize with, with its victims. And to empathize with its victims, we must know either from experience or from witnesses' stories what it means to hunger, thirst, shiver, bleed, or tremble in fear. The memory of past horror will make us loathe to accept it in the present. Yet it isn't clear that we must recall past wrongs in order to struggle against present ones, or that such recollection invariably leads to fight wrongdoing. Take, for example, someone who has not undergone a major wrongdoing himself, but who relies instead of witnesses of past wrongdoings. 
Can that memory motivate him more than vivid portrayals of present suffering can? It seems that, that when it comes to motivating persons to struggle against wrongdoing, we can safely let go of the memory of distant suffering because reports of fresh sufferings are plentiful. The memory of past suffering may stimulate empathy with today's victims. Such memory may not be necessary or even the best means toward that end. Thus, remembering suffering does not seem indispensable to generate solidarity. Or take someone who herself has been wronged in deeply painful ways. Her indifference to another's suffering, precisely on account of her own, is also a possible, even reasonable response. Why should she, of all people, add the burden of caring for others to the burden of nursing her own wounds and mending her own shattered life? There are good answers to these questions, but they don't lie in memory itself, but in the broader set of convictions about the nature of reality and our responsibility in it. Though memory of our own suffering can be a motivating force to alleviate others' suffering, it can also turn our eyes away from sufferers. By itself, memory of wrongs seem insufficient to generate solidarity. Finally, trauma literature consistently warns that those who have suffered violence are prone to repeat the act of victimization, either as victims or as perpetrators. Someone who was physically abused as a child may repeat the act as an adult caught in the cycle of victim and perpetrator. Memories of wrongs committed against a person may create new victims rather than generate solidarity with existing ones. To be a means of salvation, memories themselves must be saved. When it comes to generating solidarity with victims, memories of wrongs may be expendable, are certainly insufficient, and are potentially dangerous. They can engender empathy and mitigate against oppression but they also can lead to indifference and even trigger renewed violence, hardly means of salvation. The fourth and final way in which memory can serve as a means of salvation is by serving to protect victims from further violence. As Elie Wiesel puts it in his Nobel lecture, from his youth on as a survivor of the Holocaust, he believed that memory of evil will serve as a shield against evil that the memory of death will serve as a shield against death. Though Wiesel describes this belief as existential and not based on controlled observation, at least in one of its aspects, the belief seems immediately plausible. A notable feature of evil is that it seeks to cloak itself with the mantle of goodness in order to hide its true nature. Whenever he can... Satan, to use the biblical imagery, will appear as the angel of light precisely to enhance his satanic work. Evil thrives when it is concealed and languishes when it is exposed. When the light of memory is directed on an evildoer, she and others like her are likely to retreat out of fear of exposure. When the light of memory is switched off, more wrongdoing is likely to follow. It would then seem that memories that memory's power to serve as a protective shield for victims is undeniable. And yet even here, things are more complicated than they at first appear. Though in many cases memory can reign in evildoers, in other cases it may go them on. Persuaded in the rightness of their abominable cause, some evildoers commit atrocities in order to be remembered. This is in part the motivation of terrorists or at least their search for publicity appears so motivated from the perspective of those who radically disagree with them. The memory of their deeds is their glory, which is why in many ancient cultures, including Israel, blotting out the memory of perpetrators was not a crime against victims, as we are inclined to think today, but a punishment against tormentors. A more significant problem with the protective function of memory than its occasional opposite effect is that protection itself can be a deeply problematic endeavor. As victims see, seek to protect themselves, they're not immune to became, becoming perpetrators. Indeed, as the deft and gloomy aphorist Emil Ciaran has observed, the great persecutors are often recruited among the martyrs not quite beheaded. 
memory of their own persecution makes them see dangers lurking even when, where there are none. It leads them to exaggerate dangers that exist and overreact with excessive violence or inappropriate preventive measures so as to ensure their own safety. Victims often become, will often become perpetrators precisely on account of memories. It is because they remember past victimization that they feel justified, justified committing violence today. Or rather, it is because they remember their past victimization that what to most observers looks like violence born out of intolerance or even hatred is deemed by the perpetrators as rightful self-protection. The shield of memory so easily turns into a sword. Memories of past suffering are ambiguous. They can protect, but they can also generate violence. How can salvation lie in remembering wrongdoing and suffering? Instead of simply protecting someone, it may wound another. Instead of generating solidarity with victims, it may breed indifference and reinforce cycles of violence. Instead of acknowledging wrongdoing, it may prop up victims' false self-perceptions and unjust demands. Instead of healing wounds, it may simply repeat injury. Remembering wrongs will forge an identity, but it may be the identity of a person imprisoned in his or her own past and condemned to repeat it. Notice the word may in previous sentences. Memory of wrongs may wound, may breed indifference, may reinforce false sense or false self-perception. I am not arguing that remembering wrongs must do all of that, or even that as a rule it will. In no way do I want once to one-sidedly associate remembering wrongs with perdition. Rather, my point is that such memory is dangerously ambiguous. So my conclusion is entitled Disambiguating Memories. Wiesel is well aware that the memory of wrongs committed or suffered, even memory of the Holocaust, is ambiguous and can therefore be deeply problematic. Of all people he knows of memory's pain and therefore victims' deep need to, as he puts it in Forgotten, wipe out traces of days that are blacker than nights. And he clearly knows of the memory's misuse, of their ability to create false sense of identity, generate hatred, or breed indifference instead of creating solidarity with, vi with victims and to lead to violence rather than justice. Wars in the former Yugoslavia in the 90s have led him, a prophet of memory, to see clearly that memory itself can be made into an abomination. In Bosnia, he writes that tormented land, it is memory that is a problem. It is because they remember what happened to their parents or their sister or their grandparents that they hate each other. He even concedes in an interview that the negative use of memory has loomed larger throughout history than the positive one has. At the edges of his work, Wiesel points to the need to redeem memories if they are themselves to be redeeming. Yet perhaps understandably, he leaves this problem basically unexplored and cries out in as many creative ways as he can master the one dominant injunction, remember. If memory is important, even saving, and if it is at the same time dangerous, then it is essential to explore ways of disambiguating memory. What does it take to remember well, to remember in redeeming rather than destructive ways? How can we help memory become a bridge between enemies instead of a deep and dark ravine that separates them? How can former enemies remember together so as to be able to reconcile? And how can they reconcile so as to be able to remember together? These questions express what I consider to be the most important challenge facing the theory and practice of memory in our conflict-ridden world. Thank you very much. I'm instructed to recognize questions and uh, field them myself. So there you go now. <laughs> yes.
Yes. So there, it's a very good question because uh, m memories, very private memories, are at the same time not just private memories. They have been refracted through the public mirror, so to say, so that you, you remember that which the public reflects uh, to you. In that sense, you can achieve, I take it, a measure of healing internally on your own, and yet for the full healing even of the self, let alone of larger social body, you need to address the question of collective or communal memories. And um, I suspect you can, you can try to address that at, at the different, uh, different levels, um, uh, levels of smaller communities of folks, uh, levels of larger political uh, community. Um, I, my own personal interest is uh, exploring the role of uh, religious communities uh, uh, as a site of alternative communal framing of personal memories and therefore um, as mediators of healing to the persons, which then can also mediate toward the larger public, uh, larger public. But it will be a very much of a contested, uh, contested question. And, and wider, more, more widely you expand it, and more public the event it is, the more contested it is going to, uh, it is going to be. Yes, Ron. I'd be interested in hearing you talk a little bit more about ambiguity, disambiguity, and salvation, because that was a suggestive, but only suggestive conclusion that disambiguating memory is somehow a path to making memory saving. And you, I, you clearly can't admit that the kind of complexity and the you know, sensitive exploration that you did of precisely the ambiguity of memory is something that should be given up. It somehow, it seems to me, has to be maintained. And so I, I, it's not quite clear what, what work the DIS is doing here to me for, for, for this, the saving quality of, the, of this suggestive conclusion. Because there is a sense in which you don't want to give up. It's the very complexity of the, of the kind of path you've taken us on that is in part, it seems, I would have thought the message was, it is in part the means to transforming memory into something saving. So disambiguating strikes me as, on the face of it, too simple. And so it would be interesting to hear you talk about it a little, a little bit more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I think that the pathway through these complexities of how memories function and what we do with our memories is um, essential to well, first to understanding what is happening in our uh, both private and public uh, memories, but then also uh, in uh, getting a handle on, uh, on memories. And what I suggested in terms of disambiguating is not closing our eyes to the ambiguities of memory, but rather walking through the ambiguities and redeeming the memories themselves so that they can serve as a bridge. I, can, I cannot see how it can be any value to, I can see how it can be value to be aware of the dark sides of memory, but I can't see how it can be of significant value to prop them up, <laughs> right? The, 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 the exposure which I was undertaking is a preparatory work uh, to explore the possibilities in which a person might be, able, might be able to, say just on one element, which I was saying, strive to remember truthfully rather than to give herself or give himself up 
to kind of the play which memories uh, have with the person. Which, yes, of course. Of course. One of the things I was thinking about is how you then might work with, in the context of Christian theology, with the symbols of cross and resurrection in relationship to the question of ambiguity and disambiguity. Because if, if one thinks of the gospel narratives about the appearances of Jesus, the bodily appearance continues to have the stigmata even though the body has been transformed in some fashion. So it's, it's that element of continuity, even though it's overcome and, and triumphed yeah. over, I'm looking to see how that works out in this, in this vision that you're, you're setting before us. It's how the wounds continue, even though yeah. they no longer are painful. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't think the disambiguating memories, in in that sense, um, means uh, kind of the, the removal of the negative from the memory. Not not yet. Not need not be right. The presence of the negative in the memory does not necessarily entail the negative function of that <laughs> memory. And I was interested in exploring the function of that uh, memory. Now, whether to some extent. Um, um, we ought to share a, a dimension of Augustine's uh, vision where the presence of the negativity itself in a certain form is problematic for the full redemption of a person who remembers. Now, that may be a separate question from the one that I was pursuing here. I'm happy to pursue that other question. I have some strong opinions about that, <laughs> but um, just as a clarification. Um, Francis and then Sarah. Um, I was wondering how much, uh, whether you've done reflecting on the absence of memory and, and how one overcomes it. Uh, let me give an example. I think about it all the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, Germany. Yeah. You know, this, every theologian in Germany reflects on Auschwitz. And connected with the memory is the notion of a collective guilt. If one looks at the United States, there's a lot of reflection today about 9-11, in which we as Americans are the victims. And there's very little memory of where we as Americans cause suffering. Think about treatment of the Native Americans. Think of, of treatment of slavery. Yeah. Think of our, uh, let's say, exploitation in terms of third world countries. America has no collective memory of having caused victimization in any of these ways. And so as a theologian, we're dealing with a country that recently has a memory of being victimized, but has no memory of ever victimizing. No, I think it, 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 you're pointing to a real problem. And in a sense, it, I think it takes, it takes a major defeat of the type that Germany has suffered uh, you know, to, to bring into public consciousness uh, uh, the, the, the suffering one has, one has caused. America has been blessed and cursed <laughs> with no defeat. Uh, though though I, I suspect something like Vietnam uh, functions, if I understand this country well enough, the memory of Vietnam functions uh, as this kind of uh, a memory of American uh, guilt. I suspect uh, Iraq might soon function in that way. I'm not quite sure, but uh, it, it might in, in a foreseeable future. But as you point out, these, the, it's nothing at the scale in which Germany has experienced that. And I doubt it would be possible in Germany were it not for immensity of the atrocity uh, and the defeat uh, of the perpetrator. Uh, these two things together, with a number of other things coming along, uh, make for a country's self-perception of uh, as a perpetrator. Thank you for a very, very rich talk. I know this is part of a larger project. Um, a two-sided question. You said actually rather little about God in relation to and I'm wondering whether you think of God as having some particular relation to memory. Uh, do you have a theory in your theological anthropology of how the memory relates to other parts of the self, um, the intellect, the will, the human organism, the triad? Do you have a theory 
you have a fully formed theological notion of memory, because I think you spoke as if we all knew what memory was. Um, that's one side. The other side of the question then is, do you perceive or do you think of um, God having, as having any specific way of transforming our memory? I mean, are there practices in relation to God that could be uh, utilized to transform our memory? Yeah, that's that's one of those. Uh, it's a wonderful questions uh, <laughs> that that are that are uh, kind of huge and uh, and unanswerable. Um, I, I've given a lot of thought about how God or religious practices uh, in my own tradition, how Christian uh, religious uh, practices um, may function as healing. Uh, instruments, all the while knowing that these very practices also have served as also deeply wounding <laughs> uh, memories upon uh, and, and causes would be too strong of a term, but, but at least uh, served as an impetus, uh, not just to heal, but also to, to wound. Um, I, I do think that it's that is essential for, uh, I mean, my, my, for instance, my account of uh, an anthropological account is significant uh, here because without uh, a developed anthropology, for instance, an anthropology which sees the identity so closely tied with narrative, and in particular with the past narrative, seems to me to have great difficulties with dealing with the question of memory. I, don't, I, have a, uh, I have a rather different account of memory I, uh, or, or of, of, of identity. Um, it seems to me that memory functions uh, in terms of identity is, is much more fragmentary and fragmented. It seems to me that uh, much can be cut out, incised, and we'll still rather ourselves, uh, right? So, so from one end... Sorry? Right. That that's, that strikes me as not not right. It it may it may it may it may be right. It, it may be uh, interesting and uh, and possibly right as a guiding image of how the remembering functions. But if I want to ask the question of a, of a relationship between identity and memory, that seems to be not right. I don't I don't see our identity as simply being. Uh, kind of storehouse into which things are just stuffed in and we can just order them but they're all all there. I rather see it very much of constructive effort and not just constructive but permanently reconstructive uh, effort, never stable, always shifting and, and changing if you want very much a post-structuralist account of memory. If you want. So, so that's on the, on, the, on the memory side but I see also identity of human beings as very much being eccentric, uh, very much being being the self outside of oneself, and that comes from the layer, so to say, on the top of this shifting character of memories, and their relationship to divine, relationship to God, plays a very significant role for me, and very much in particular, relationship to Christ. Um, and it's that relationship to, to Christ that forms the center of, of the self and frees the self from the claim of the past that the past has on the self. And then you can think of various practices, uh, liturgical practices uh, uh, and, and other practices which can uh, help guide a person in such purification of one's own memory, all the while knowing that one is entering a relatively dangerous ground, though I don't know how to avoid those kinds of dangers. Uh, one and two. Um, many of us base our religion on uh, our our religion is based on revealed, uh, the revealed notion of Christ. But uh, the way that Christ is revealed is not mediated to us directly, but through the gospel writers who are using their memory to get us the information concerning Christ. Um, it seems like for you the fragmentary notions of, uh, of memory are all right, but stuff that's false is bad medicine. It's, it's no good. 
like you said, it, it adds to the evil rather than distracts from it. Mm -hmm. How much of this revealed religion do we have to make scientifically perfectly provable and push past push past anything that the gospel writers would have put in there as not just fragments that were misremembered, but as deceitful memories uh, in order to paint a different picture of Christ. Yeah, I, t I take it that um, the deceitfulness of memory for me is, is, is a problem. Uh, I don't have a post tractorist account of truth. Um, not so. So, so, um, so fragmentary identities are quite all right. I think that's just about right because it's true. It seems to me. All how right. Are we, how are we uh, but to know to act on this. How are we to know the difference between a, a fragment that seems false and something that is false uh, in in a memory? As far as how are we to know if if I say that I saw somebody jump over the building? that I didn't think I saw that, as opposed to making it up. Well, I mean, if you stay, if you stay simply with yourself, uh, let me take, this is a, that's a question B to the, <laughs> to, to the question A about the, uh, about the Gospels and, and the memories. I think that you, your first question is, I think it's a very, it's a very significant one. To what degree uh, do we have to, um, if we use the Gospels, as I, I clearly use them, I, I see a kind of a narrative structure, of the Gospels, uh, and I use them uh, in, in some of the constructive work that, that I'm doing. I think that the question is, is, fair, is fair enough. To what degree are these memories of deceitful ones? That has to be taken very seriously. Um, now, how one does that? Um, what's the best way to proceed uh, there? That, that's the contested field of historical study of, uh, of the New Testament and its relationship to both the present text that we have and also to what the believing community may want to make out of, out of that text. Uh, I think we need to embark upon that text. We cannot bracket it as, as, as an insignificant, uh, insignificant one. Um, what results that will bring about how skeptical one ought to be about the results that one reads about, that's a different issue. And I have a great deal of skepticism that we are able to get behind the, the texts myself. But it's not an irrelevant question. It's a very significant and important question. For if it proves to be deceitful and it, it is then unjust and harmful and therefore problematic. That's, that's very interesting. I don't know the book, so I'll have to, I'll, I'll have to read it. Um, but on the whole, it would seem to me that at least Christian narrative, um, kind of a larger story that's being, that's being told, ought not to make it difficult for a person um, to call into question both the innocence of the victim and the so sort of the 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 the, the, the uh, satanized radical evil of the of the perpetrator, because of the, there are elements of that story, right, which 
militate so strongly against it. So I think the kinds of, say, Nietzsche and sensibility about the, um, the, the victims, um, the, 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 the victim's life, inner life and outer life, teeming with scheming and subversions uh, of the kind that, that cannot be proclaimed as, uh, as noble, right, and let alone uh, good. That seems to be not quite foreign to the tradition. I mean, of course, he, he gets it straight from Luther, right? He just uh, drops certain elements of Luther and understanding of, of radical sinfulness of human beings, simul justus uh, peccator, and gets it right, right there. So when Nietzsche says, to live is to be unjust, but straight out of Luther, I think, in many regards, uh, Luther would have greeted it plus or and minus certain things, of course. So, so my sense would be, yes, if you, if you think of those narratives as simply kind of schematized, here's an innocent person who suffers, a perpetrator that becomes evil. If you, if you look at that narrative simply at that flat level of one and the other, rather than inserting it into a larger narrative, then you, do, you can end up with, with rather, rather dangerous uh, usages of that tradition. But I think I'm most struck in the, in the New Testament texts. Uh, and, and there are things that, I, that, are, that are, they're clearly uh, uh, questionable in those texts. But what I'm most struck in, what I find extraordinary feature of New Testament literature almost as a whole, is this combination of ability to name what is considered to be a wrongdoing as a wrongdoing in rather strong language also, and at the same time, willingness to suffer on behalf of the wrongdoer. That's in a sense a story. You, you, you have it, for instance, in, in John's Gospel. One of the uh, extraordinary features of that, of that Gospel notwithstanding the very strong uh, language that one finds, especially in relation to Jewish-Christian relations. It's a text that has to be handled with very great, great care. But in that very gospel, you find this combination. Here's the story, right? story that the Son of God is a Lamb of God from the start <laughs> for precisely giving his life for the world. So I think that has shaped the tradition, at least at its best, so that the fact of somebody's non-innocence does not mean your againstness uh, against them. It means your willingness even to give your life on account of for that uh, person. So it seems to me that there are elements, and sorry, it's a long answer to say, it seems to me that there are elements in the Christian story which, if properly highlighted, which, if properly developed, and that's why I think that the work of constructive theology is so extraordinarily culturally, ecclesially important. Uh, if highlighted properly, I think can serve uh, serve us rather rather well. Uh, now I'm looking at this side here, uh, so why don't I two more? Two more. So why don't I go uh, one comment here and then the other here, and we'll have to leave this side unattended for a while. Um, yes. My question is: there's a difference between victim and sinner. Um, so you know, it makes sense to me that on the level of sinner. Um, if someone's a, 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 a sort of profession of the Christian faith, um, the understanding is that no one is innocent. No one is, no one is fully innocent. Yeah. On the level of charitable law, civil law, we do make determinations um, that someone may be a victim <coughs> and without going into the question of whether or not this person is innocent. Can yeah. you sort of extrapolate on um, what the role of civic institutions would be if you were talking about the memory? Um. There are going to be a lineup of questions okay. here. Let me, let me take let me take let me take the first first part, which uh, which I think is a very very good one. I don't think we should confuse the two categories: sinner or victim, or for that matter, I think sinner and perpetrator. Those are distinct uh, categories, and ought to be uh, ought to be kept uh, as as distinct. Um, but. The point that I'm, uh, I'm making, I, I think the point that, that, that can be traced from Luther to, uh, to, to Nietzsche right, is that the, the presumption of innocence of the weak, the presumption of innocence of the victim, I don't think is a presumption that one necessarily ought to have. There are many cases in which victim is innocence, innocent. 
My sense is that the longer the interaction between victim and perpetrator has gone, and most of our violence is not haphazard act of violence on unsuspecting uh, person, it is, a, it is a long history of interaction. The longer you have that history going, the less likely you will be able to write a story of clear light on one side and clear darkness on the other side. You will have to write a rather murky story. Uh, even if that murky story uh, is there, though, some judgments will be, a, you will be still able to make judgments of being a perpetrator, being a victim in particular uh, cases. You just have to situate that in the larger uh, narrative. I think in, in those kind of complex stories, I think we have to, we have to be very careful how we, how we read stories and uh, how we read our actions and even act in provisional way. I was just yesterday lecturing on, giving lecture on forgiveness. And forgiveness, which seems such a, such a um, magnanimous uh, uh, act toward another, uh, toward another person, generous act toward another person, can indeed be a wounding. And can be, you, can, you can wound a person by forgiving them so that you need to be forgiven for forgiving the person. And you can do that partly because uh, the, 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 the complexity of the relationship uh, in which a particular act is situated cannot be sufficiently illuminated so that you know, even in the best cases, what it means to forgive in that particular case. So that forgiveness is always, already participates in, uh, um, in brokenness. And it's never, so to say, full and, and clean and pure. I hope that addresses partly your question. Civic institutions, I don't know whether we should go into them right now. One more and then we'll... The less you do, very good. The more I'm puzzled about yeah. the term and concept of salvation. Oh, yeah. it's, it seems to be such a big word. It seems to be such a theological word. Yeah. And you refer to Elie Wiesel quite a few times, and I, I'm now wondering whether he would not always have spoken about reconciliation or something like that, or actually forgiveness, and being aware and taking the whole concept of memory uh, into, leave it there, into an ethical context, really. Remember as an imperative so that history doesn't repeat itself. Yeah. Remember so that you at least are aware of the history. Remember us, the victims, and so on. If I talk about myself, the concept of healing makes perhaps sense with all the pitfalls you have referred to. With respect to others, the concept of justice makes perfect sense. But how do I get to the concept of salvation? If I turn to theology now, do I really, really get so, so much further than your link you made to theology of liberation, just remember that I, God, already brought you out of Egypt. Is there, is, yeah. With the link to memory, is, is it really appropriate, is it really adequate to, to go further than that? Yeah, and, and may, maybe, maybe the word salvation here was misleading because it, uh, it suggests immediately as this audience uh, maybe in particular um, uh, the, uh, kind of fuller account, uh, theological account, uh, even as you suggest, of salvation. And I was using it in, in a much more limited uh, kind of Wieselian understanding of salvation from which theological, strict theological overtones, uh, I think they're, they're a distant background. And I think something like salvation or redemption, if I understand his work uh, well, though I must say I'm no expert on uh, Wiesel. I've read some of his uh, work more as a, a backdrop person, a culturally influential backdrop person, not particularly because I think that he's particularly profound on memory, though he has interesting things to say, but because he is such a cultural uh, icon and, and speaks, I think, what many people think about uh, memory. So in that sense, he was significant uh, for me. And then I 
so, so I was using redemption in, in this very much innerworldly sense of, 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 the term, of the term rather than giving it any theological uh, depth. That will come in some later chapter. This is an introductory chapter to it. <laughs> <laughs> I really hate to cut this off, but the good news is that we have a reception down the hall and you can pin the speaker down for more questions about a most interesting and wonderful lecture. Thank you again, Miroslav. Good night. <laughs>